Probably the most common type of informative writing done outside the classroom is business writing. Regardless of what field you plan to enter, you will doubtless find yourself in the position of needing to know how to write a report, business letter, or memo. In this lesson, we'll look at four different kinds of business writing. Memos, business letters, reports, and resumes. There are several differences between writing an essay and writing a business report. When you write an essay, you're interested in drawing your readers into the subject and involving them so they stay with you throughout. When you write a business report, you essentially have a captive audience. The person reading your report or memo is doing so because there is already an existing interest in the topic. It's part of their job. Business writing, therefore, gets straight to the heart of the issue with little introduction or setup and not much descriptive writing interjected. Hi, I'm looking at the printouts on this. There are too many of them. Can we uh, write a justification for this or make some sort of revision to the program? Okay, see if you can get it to me tomorrow. Okay, thanks. Bye. That's what is meant by being businesslike. Communications are straightforward and to the point. A memo or report which beats around the bush lacks efficiency. It wastes the reader's time with trivial information. And in the business world, time is money. Virtually every profession requires you to know how to write a memo. Whether you're a nurse who's been asked to inform others about a specific new procedure or an engineer alerting your supervisor to the need for new equipment, you will find this form of writing necessary. A memo differs from a business letter in that it is usually intended to be read in-house. That is, it is written for others in your organization or company. Although the format for a memo may vary slightly depending on your profession or the corporation you work for, all memos follow the same general format. A memo is comprised of two parts, the heading and the message. The heading lists four items of information, the date, the name of the person the memo is going to, the person the memo is from, and the subject. This is done to help with filing, and it enables the reader to make quick reference to the memo to find out what it's about. Since you may send several memos to the same person over the course of a year, this heading helps distinguish one memo from the other. The message is usually a short one. Often it's only one or two paragraphs. And generally, it doesn't exceed more than two pages in length. The message focuses on a single topic. Although you may list several items in the memo, they will revolve around one general topic, such as budget needs or projected timelines. Keep the paragraphs short and mention only those issues which pertain to the topic. Write in a clear and direct style using the active voice. Because a memo is written to those you work with, abbreviations and specific terminology can and should be used. For example, People who work at computers all day understand that a PC is a personal computer. Or a healthcare professional knows that ICU stands for intensive care unit. Get a patient to the ICU. Get a PA in lateral chest, ABGs on room air. At the end of the memo, you need to designate whether copies have been sent to anyone other than those included in the heading. The abbreviation CC indicates circulating copy. PC stands for photocopy. Either abbreviation is followed by a colon and the name of the persons or departments receiving copies. Other kinds of notations can also be put at the end of a memo. If you have other information such as graphs, articles, or reports, the notation enclosure alerts the reader to look for additional information.
To indicate the memo was dictated and typed by someone other than the sender, the initials of the writer are capitalized and written without periods, then followed by the initials of the typist in lowercase, although there are several variations to this. In some businesses, the sender of the memo signs her name or initials the memo. This is done by the name in the heading. A business letter is for correspondence outside the organization. As a result, you usually aren't as familiar with the person or persons you're addressing as you are with the people who receive your memos. With a business letter, keep in mind you're representing your company on paper, and you therefore need to be a bit more formal than when writing a memo. A typical business letter is comprised of a heading, inside address, salutation, body, closing, and notations. The heading contains the sender's address and the date, but does not include the sender's name. Printed letterhead already provides the information required in a heading and also includes the name of your company or organization. So if you use stationery with a letterhead, you only need to write the date. The inside address includes the name, title, and address of the person receiving the letter. Address a letter to a specific person when possible. You may need to call and request the name of the person you're writing to, as well as the job title. Hello, this is Bernice Weeks with American Express. Would you please give me Miss Smith's full name and title? Be sure you spell the name correctly. Manager. Ask if you're not Thank sure. You so much. And do Bye -bye. not abbreviate the company name. The salutation, dear Mr. or Ms. Jones, is followed by a colon in a business letter. If you do not know whether the person you're addressing is male or female, use their name or initials without the Mr. or Ms. The body of a letter should, like a memo, be comprised of short paragraphs which speak directly to the subject at hand. Single space each line of a paragraph and double space between paragraphs. If you have good news for the reader, give that first. If you have bad news, a rejection for instance, put it near the end of the letter, especially if the bad news has a positive aspect. Like the informational essay, the purpose of a business letter is to inform, write in clear, direct language. Keep in mind the reader, your audience. What does this person need to know? What terminology is appropriate? Although you don't usually use statistics or quotations from other sources the way you do in a research paper, you do need to present yourself as credible, knowledgeable, and rational. If you need to persuade the person you're writing to or convince them to take action, remember that the same principles apply as they do for the argumentative essay. Present your points logically. Avoid personal attacks and emotionally charged language. And don't leap to conclusions. All of the techniques you've learned in argumentative writing can assist you in stating your case to your reader. At the end of your business letter, sum up or state the recommended action to be taken, much as you would in the conclusion of any paper. This concluding statement should be brief. You may also include information on how and when you can be reached for follow-up. Or you may want to close by thanking them for their attention to the matter and indicating that you look forward to hearing from them soon. The standard closing phrases for a business letter are sincerely, sincerely yours, and yours truly. If you use the latter, be sure you spell it correctly. Truly has no E. Cordially and best regards are more formal and are generally used when you don't know the person you are writing. The letter looks good, but could you change the closing? I don't know this person. I think we need a more formal ending. Thanks. When you don't know the person, but you know that their position is an important one, you might choose the formal closing, respectfully yours. When you type your name, it should be your full name. After your name, include your title and the name of the company for which you work, unless it's included as part of the letterhead. 
The notations at the end of a business letter are like the notations at the end of a memo, and they follow the same format. Your signature can be just your first name or a nickname if you know the person. In terms of the format as a whole, there are basically three options. The block format, modified block, or simplified format. Each organization has its own style. Check to see which is preferred. In the block format, everything is typed flush left or left justified. There are no indentations. The heading, inside address, salutation, the letter itself, and the closing are all lined up along the left-hand margin. In the modified block format, the heading and closing are indented, as well as the first line of each paragraph. If any lists are contained in the body of the letter, they are also indented. In the simplified format, the letter looks much the same as the block format, except there is no salutation and no closing. This format is used when you do not know the name or the title of the person you are writing. This approach is usually better than the very formal, to whom it may concern, or dear sir or madam. As you begin to look for a job, the first type of business letter you will write is a letter of application. Employers differ on what they want to know from a letter of application. Some prefer a short and sweet letter in which you state the position you're applying for, your availability, and any other pertinent information the employer can't get from the resume. Others may wish to get a feel for you as an individual to know what kinds of skills and interests you have, both in and out of the profession. Still, others appreciate your demonstrating a knowledge of the company and how you think you would fit into the organization. Unless you know what the employer is looking for, it's probably best to remain somewhat conservative. State the job you're interested in, give a one or two sentence summary of your personal background without going into your life story or getting cute, and indicate in a few sentences how your skills would benefit the company. Remember that this is a letter of introduction. Your resume should give the reader most of the needed information. However, if there is something not on the resume or not readily apparent, you can bring it to the reader's attention in your cover letter. You may want to summarize a few highlights of the resume in your letter. For example, although you list the dates of each of your employment situations, you may want to point out the total number of years you've worked in the field. Or even though the resume lists your awards one by one, you might find it more attention-getting to include the total number of awards you've received. This kind of information serves as a headline, a guide for reading your resume. Which brings us to the third kind of business writing, the resume. In terms of actual writing, a resume contains very little. There are few full sentences, and paragraphs are held together by headings rather than transitional phrases. But in terms of information gathering and presentation, a resume could well be one of the most important documents you will ever write. A resume is a picture of your professional and educational background in words. It can either sell you to a potential employer or it can turn them away. A resume must be concise and accurate. It must emphasize your strengths without stretching the truth. And because it represents you before you ever walk in the door, it must look good in terms of design, layout, and neatness. Hello, my name is Jim Bricker. I called about the graphics position. I've been looking forward to meeting you. The format for a resume may vary from one profession to another, but the typical resume of a college graduate usually contains the following information. There is a stated career objective, a listing of schools attended, making up your educational background, any work experience, references, and other miscellaneous or personal information. The first piece of information which should appear on your resume, of course, is your name, address, and phone number, so an employer knows who you are and how you can be reached. If you have different day and evening phone numbers, be sure to indicate that. 
And if you have a college address different from your home address, list both. Not all resumes include a career objective, but it does help to give an indication of the direction you hope to go in so the employer can better assess your potential. Over here, you can see one of our graphic artists uh, doing some computer design work. Uh, the program she's using. Many employers are looking for people who can move on a career track, people who want to advance to other jobs within the organization. When you sit down to write your career objective, think of it as the thesis of your paper. It is a one-sentence statement of your professional goals. Just as some thesis statements can be too vague or too broad, some career objectives can be nebulous and lack specific information. For example, career objective, to get a job in the field of nutrition. Obviously, you're interested in nutrition if that was your major in college, but what about nutrition? What do you want to focus on during your career? Do you want to work in a hospital planning meals for people on restricted diets? Do you want to be an experimental chemist for a food company? Do you want to work for a health food store? Run a restaurant of your own someday? Or what? So before you write your objective or any other part of your resume, sit down and assess your skills, education, and experience, and your interests. Then, just as you would narrow your topic for an essay and write the thesis, come up with a simple declarative statement that describes what you want to do. Objective, to oversee menu planning and food preparation in a large institutional environment. With this objective, you are communicating your interest in creating and planning nutritional meals, but you have not limited yourself to a particular work environment. This objective allows you to apply for jobs in schools, hospitals, factory cafeterias, hotels, and many other areas. Even if you do not include a career objective statement in the resume itself, it's a good idea to write one because it will help you know what kinds of things to highlight when listing your skills and experiences. Ask yourself, what kinds of skills are needed for the kind of job I want? What background do I have that makes me qualified for such a career? Just as your key points in an essay should all relate to the thesis by providing supporting evidence, so the work experience you list in the resume should relate to your objective. Under the heading Educational Background, list all the schools you have attended, beginning with the most recent and ending with high school. Do not include grammar or elementary schools. For high school and college, include dates of attendance, your major and minor areas of study, and the degrees you've received or expect to receive. To decide whether to list your experience or education first, determine which is more relevant to the position you seek. If your education primarily has prepared you for the job, list it first. If it's the work experience, then that should be first. When you list your work experience, again, start with the most recent job you've held and include your current job. And this is a game called Up the River. List the dates of employment, including the month and year you began and terminated. Also state the title of your position, as well as the name and address of the company you worked for. A brief description of your responsibilities should follow. Each of these should be no longer than a paragraph, and your sentences should not be complete sentences. Rather, they should be sentence fragments, which begin with action verbs. In an essay, you might say, I really enjoyed working in the toy department, where I helped children pick out educational toys. It was fun as well as stimulating. I selected toys for purchase and arranged items for display. However, in a resume, you would describe the task this way. Supervise the retail operations of toy department in a major department store. Selected and displayed items for purchase. Under the heading of other information, list any awards, scholarships, and honors received, as well as the organizations you belong to and the extracurricular activities you've been involved in. Again, try to limit your list to the kinds of activities which reinforce your career objectives. Employers can tell when you're trying to pad your resume by listing any organization you've ever joined. When you list your references, you need to provide the names, titles and affiliations, addresses, and phone numbers of those persons who can speak for your abilities and potential in the job market. 
But before you list anyone as a reference, be sure to check with them first, both as a courtesy and to ask their permission. Hi, Mr. Smith. This is Lucy Green. I'm fine. How are you? Yes, I'm applying for a position in... Some business people suggest not listing references as a way of showing confidence. If you prefer not to list your references, you're also in a better position to tailor your list to each specific job you apply for. Some people can speak better to your academic skills and others to your work experience. Some know your abilities in the field you want to work in. Others are more acquainted with your character. If you decide not to list your references, simply state, references available upon request, or you leave it out altogether. That's basically everything you need to put in a resume. Once you get a job, you'll need to be familiar with another type of business writing, the report. Writing a business report requires more in-depth writing than any of the other kinds of writing we've discussed. You may be asked to survey your fellow employees and write up a report about morale, or you may be required to write a more complex piece, such as a report on the year's profit and losses, complete with charts and graphs. Or you may simply need to turn in a monthly report of your accomplishments and those of your department. Whatever the assignment, the task of writing a business report will very much resemble the process for writing a research paper. In some cases, you will actually conduct formal research through questionnaires or other means of gathering data. You may need to locate background resource materials, interview people in the company, or visit other companies and departments to collect information. I've been here a little over three years now. Okay. The skills you learned for taking notes, for critically evaluating sources, and outlining your ideas will all be important here. Writing this kind of report will also resemble writing an informative essay. In general, you'll begin by stating the problem you researched and its significance to your organization. Your introduction may need to provide the reader with some background information so they can understand the context of the problem you're addressing. For example, suppose you are the personnel director of a shoe manufacturing company and you've been asked to write a report on the pros and cons of setting up a daycare center inside the plant. Before you state the subject of your report, you need to inform the reader of the necessity for the study. You may open the report by saying that tardiness and attendance are at an all-time low and that an employee survey indicated that problems finding daycare and babysitters was the main cause. Or you may indicate that an employee petition prompted the study. Or you could start by quoting statistics nationwide regarding the need for daycare in the workplace. Whatever your reasons for writing the report, state them clearly and succinctly and let the reader know why and what you are reporting on. The body of your report will follow the same format as other kinds of essays. Some reports are purely informational. You present your findings or the opinions of others without commentary. It is also helpful to organize the material for your report with headings. Other reports in which you're required to present recommendations will resemble the argumentative essay. You'll be asked to not only inform, but also to interpret that information and sway the reader to take specific action. There are also okay, reports which require no research. A monthly report, for example, presents the status of the projects you've been assigned, the outcome of those projects, or reasons for delays. Or you may be required to write a report for each case you deal with. Social workers, for example, must turn in reports after they've visited an assigned family. These kinds of reports are more narrative in form. They are usually written in first person using either I or we, depending on whether you're talking about your own accomplishments or those of the whole department. Certain professions have certain specified formats for these reports. Police investigators, for example, must use specific language and descriptions in filing their reports. Doctors and medical personnel follow different but very structured formats. Whatever the difference is, the basic skills you've learned over the course of this class will hold you in good stead when you enter your chosen field. Writing informative papers is a little like learning how to ride a bicycle. You may get rusty or wobbly if you haven't done it for a while, but once you've learned how, you'll always be able to apply these skills to any business situation. Fill in the 
the blank to complete the following sentences. The heading of a memo consists of four items. The date, the name of the person the memo is going to, the person the memo is from, and the subject. The subject of the memo should be included in the heading. When writing a memo, abbreviations and specific terminology can and should be used because a memo is intended to be read in-house. Memos are intended for people within the organization as opposed to a formal business letter intended for people outside the organization. When writing a business letter, you can indicate that additional copies have been sent to others by using the following abbreviation at the bottom of the page. The abbreviation C or CC followed by a colon and the person's name indicates additional copies have been sent. Like the informational essay, the purpose of a business letter is to inform. As you begin to look for a job, the first type of business letter you will write is a letter of application. A letter of application usually accompanies a resume. A comma follows the person's name in the salutation in informal letters. The salutation in a business letter, however, is followed by a colon. The career objective of a resume allows an employer to assess your professional goals. Career objectives should be short and accurately reflect your career interests. When listing education and work experience on a resume, always start with the most recent. By beginning with the most recent experience, you are providing your potential employer with a quick assessment of your abilities.